So um, thanks for the invitation. So, um, so it was just a slight mistake that Wendy made. She said, so tell them like what you do and how NLP is important. Oh, yeah. And like, I just love to talk and tell you. So I'm going to start by telling you what I do because um, it's possible that some of you might be interested in doing some of, of this stuff, given that you're in this class. Um, and then I'm going to uh, tell you about what we do um, as a very sad replacement for NLP. And then maybe you'll be encouraged to come and help us out uh, someday also. So I'm going to talk about Utah Gene Discovery Study Designs. There's a couple of different study designs. and. Um, and a slightly different issues. I'm going to quickly tell you about Utah genealogy resources because um, that's what this kind of all circles around. And then we're going to talk about phenotype data. So gene discovery designs, there, there's really two. And Wendy sort of introduced this. So um, we study high risk pedigrees. So um, because there's a, in Utah a genealogy that's linked to lots of different medical phenotype data or trait data, um, you can actually go in and Find a person maybe born in the 18 or 17 or 1800s who among their descendants, there's a statistical excess of a disorder. So that pedigree has way more prostate cancer than it should. So that's a high risk prostate cancer pedigree and we study it. And the way we study it typically, I mean, things have changed uh, Techniques are so much more powerful today. But for instance, in this pedigree, I would probably take, um, is, is this, is there like a pointer? Yeah, but I'm probably going to. Um, the batteries usually wear out. Yeah, it might be dead. It's OK. It's OK. I, I, so I might take, like, um, do you guys know what cousins look like in a pedigree? <laughs> like kids of siblings or so. So you can see right at the beginning there, there's a few cousins. Oh, you're so nice. Thank you. Oh, OK. And it's, um, oh, you're so nice. OK. So I, I might take like one of these prostate cancer cases here and a cousin. So like this guy or this guy or this guy. There's a lot of cousins in this um, pedigree. So we might even only take two of them and generate sequence data across their whole genome to, um, to look for uh, variants that they actually share. So cousins don't share that much, um, like 7% of their genome. So if they share a disease and they share a piece of their genome, wherever that piece of genome is that sharing is very likely to harbor the the gene that may be responsible for this. So, but back to phenotype. Um, so we are assuming that every person we're calling affected shares the same genetic material, and we're trying to identify that. So um, if I miss a few diagnoses in this pedigree, like say there's even 10 more prostate cancer cases, doesn't affect my ability to do my study at all. I've already identified it as a high-risk pedigree. And if I'm happy with my case diagnoses, I know these two guys are OK. I don't really care if they have kids and other cousins. So misdiagnoses really aren't a problem. But false positives, maybe you can start to see, are just completely deadly. They would just destroy the experiment. So. If I actually thought that this guy had prostate cancer and he didn't, and I compared his genetics to someone else in the pedigree who had prostate cancer, it, it could just completely destroy the power of the experiment. So, so, um, so phenotype can be incredibly important, but there's different levels of, uh, like different types of faults that are good and bad. Another type of genetic study we do is a case control association or validation study. You've seen them in the literature. They're called GWAS, genome-wide association studies. So here, you take a bunch of people who are your cases, so they have some disease. Let's stick with prostate cancer, because you can't tell if they're men or women. So then you look at some you know, genetic marker and see how many of them have the C allele, and it's like 60%, and how many have the T allele. So you say, OK, that's the, that's the frequency of 
of these particular alleles in the population of men with prostate cancer, does it differ from the population frequency overall? So for that set of people, these guys need to be controls. They cannot, oh, there's actually a phenotype on there. They cannot have the disease you're interested in, or they're going to look too much like the cases, and you're trying to find a difference. So here in a case control association, again, if you didn't capture every case in the population in your study, that's not going to hurt you if, you, if you if some of them have been missed, as long as your cases really are cases. But if some of your controls really, you think they don't have the disease, but they do, you're not going to have the power to show a difference. So your best controls, you could use population controls, but for the best controls, for the most power, the absence of a phenotype has to be established. And, and as you know from your work, that's a little more difficult than establishing the presence of a phenotype. Okay, so that's the kind of studies we do. Now I'm just going to quickly talk about genealogies. Plain and simple, this is totally off the topic. It's just because it's my favorite topic and I just have to talk about it. So, um, so there's two big genealogies in Utah. So back in the 70s, um, Mark Skolnick came and built the computerized genealogy of Utah. And I was lucky enough to join his group. It actually was a long time ago. It's like, it's like almost 40 years ago. I was like a student like you guys. And anyway, um, he, he built this resource, um, and, uh, and it's grown. Uh, nowadays, it, when he built it, it had about 2 million people. He got data from the Family History Library of the Mormon Church and computerized and record linked. Nowadays, they add data from vital stats. So it's got 7 million people. Three million of them have pretty decent genealogy parents, grandparents. Um, and in some cases, it's up to 12 generations deep. Um, so that's awesome all by itself, a, gen a computerized genealogy. But it's been linked to statewide death certificates from 1904, statewide cancer data from 1966, and the um, EDWs of the two big health care providers in Utah from like 1994. So phenotype heaven. For somebody who wants to study the heritable patterns of diseases, you've got you know people's genetic relationships, and you can establish phenotypes or traits from all this linked data. Um, interestingly, it's also been linked to other things that might give you, like your residents might give you your socioeconomic status, some exposures. Uh, census would give you occupation, a driver's license, your BMI. Um, and then because this is was such a wonderful resource and so successful. I, I was always trying to convince people to make it bigger, but nobody really wanted to. They thought it was pretty cool, and it is pretty cool, but, but I wanted bigger. So I right now have some VA funding, and we're building the genealogy of the United States, and we're linking it to the 25 million VHA patients. Um, so we're in like our... Um, Oh, we're probably, to be fair, I think we're really in our, just finishing our fourth year of funding. Our genealogy is 80 million people already, and we already linked to almost a million of those VHA patients. Um, actually, no, that was when it was only 63 million. So every time we add 20 or 30 million people, we get another million um, VHA patients linked. So. Um, so this, again, a, a very important genealogy link to phenotype resource. So that's kind of like the basic tool that I use. And the genealogy is valuable, extremely important to know the biological relationships between people. Um, but as we saw before, it's really all about the phenotype. Before you move on, yeah, because you like talking about this, <laughs> any thought about kind of crowdsourcing it? To the extent that, okay, so we have all the Utah data. Utah's been exporting population for 50, 60 years. Probably a lot of them still have kind of Utah connection, but just kind of, you know, the rise of things like Ancestry, 
I mean, I'm just kind of, yeah. you know, I got data at San Diego, Pittsburgh. I'm in here right now. Yeah. It's but it seems just, like once you'd be interested in these, if I could provide documentation like my pathology reports from Yeah, Pittsburgh. it's a really interesting issue. So, so that's... Part of that is in another talk that I give. Like I have my, you know, I'm a missionary for various things, and and this is like totally. But but I, I tried to convince, yeah, I tried to convince Intermountain that they should have a family health history institute, and we could gather genealogy. All of this, is, that that VA, it's all from publicly. We just go out and cruise the internet and grab genealogy. It is all publicly available genealogy. But I, I tried to convince them, we'll go and get what's out there and start our genealogy. And then we'll ask people, come in here and put your genealogy in. And then we'll ask them, come in here and, and put the health history that you know about your relatives. I, I totally agree with you. I think someday that's the way, that's the only way to build this. And, you know, people need to know, you, you're, you're, Potential risks, your risk for diseases, it depends a little bit on, on you, but it depends a lot on your genetics. Your family history is the best risk predictor for most things that are going to happen to you in your life. It's again, I'm biased, it's my, but, but I, I think that would be totally awesome, and I think about that a lot. That's. And the, the pop culture of genealogy hobby, which I've you know, been involved in too. Uh, so it's, it's kind of out there already, Ancestry.com, all those other places. Like my genealogy is published. The pedigree is, is out there in lots of places yeah, already. Yeah, so, so you're... Finding the standardized way yeah. to capture it. So you're, you're in ours, because I remember when, when we first started building the genealogy with our collaborators, they're the, actually the same people who built the UPDP first genealogy, and they said, yeah, um, genealogy is like the second most popular hobby next to stamp collecting, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's impressive, because everybody collects stamps. I mean, but, but it's turned into the coolest thing on the planet. We had, I, I could go on forever. We had, I had this person from Norway contact me because I, I did 23 and Me, and they're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure we're related, and it's like seven generations back. And I'm like, you know, I don't know. I thought I was from, like, Scotland and the Isle of Man. And then I asked my genealogy people, and they go, no, you're like a Viking. So my kids are like, we want names. We want to know who these Norwegian, yeah, cousins are. So, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, Oh, it's so much fun. So gene discovery, again, this is just to let you know what we do. So we've studied thousands of high-risk pedigrees. We've got like 40,000 DNAs in our freezer. Um, the cool thing is I studied them some, for something. Like, okay, it was a breast cancer pedigree. Um, but, you know, eventually people go on and die of something. And so... Um, the IRB told me that I could waive consent after people were deceased and study them for something else. So for instance, I can go in and find all the people who, whose death certificate or say, said they died of Alzheimer's and, and they have different relationships to the other people with Alzheimer's, but I can find Alzheimer's high risk pedigrees. I have a grant right now to study um, Alzheimer's and another one to study diabetes that we created from this resource. So, <clears throat> excuse me, keeping phenotypes up to date and continuing to link them is, is, has been hugely valuable. Um, and then again, we, we use these pedigrees to find uh, genes. And this is kind of an example. I I'm, I'm mostly work in the cancer world, but we study diabetes, um, pelvic organ prolapse, rotator cuff, some new um, pediatric kind of malformations <laughs> of of the brain and the GI system. So all, all kinds of different phenotypes. And, and they all have their own um, phenotype problems. Um, OK, so, so what kind of data do you need to do the, these genetic studies? Well, certainly you need a, the family history and the genealogy. But let's just say that that one's done. That's settled. But, but also we need to know phenotype. And, and as I told you, um, it's, it is a little easier to establish presence of a phenotype than absence of a phenotype. And it's actually even worse than that. Over the years, people have asked me, you know, hey, could we study like 
um, resistance to the influenza virus based on like people who didn't die in the um, in the pandemic flu in the 1919s? Or you know, how about what could you find me a a pedigree that's like resistant to prostate cancer? And it's a it's a fantastic concept, um, but it's even more difficult just than looking through someone's medical record and ruling out you know that they, they absolutely positively never had prostate cancer. It's a little bit worse because we have a resource that's um, limited by censorship. So. If um, somebody comes to me, and, or if there's some person I'm trying to find their phenotype, um, maybe they never made it into the genealogy data. Maybe they never made it into the tumor registry. If they were diagnosed outside Utah, or before 1966, 73, somewhere in there, they're not gonna be in the tumor registry. Or maybe they just have a, a name that's like so common that they didn't link to the right person. So there's a million ways that you can get censored out of a database like we have here, and you're gonna look like you don't have the phenotype, but you might have the phenotype. So it's just yet another level to be worried about. But, but let's only worry about establishing the positives because actually for genetic studies, that's quite sufficient for most of the stuff we do. So there's a ton of different sources that we might go to to establish phenotype. Pathology, diagnosis, treatment response, and, and I, I'm really into this, you know, keeping track of your lifetime medical history and every lab result and every procedure and every everything, a lifetime story. We can also keep track of environmental exposures to help us with some phenotypes that have strong or even require an exposure. Um, to express themselves. And then genetic data and testing could also help, although that's kind of secondary. So the world I live in, we're trying to figure out from all the data that's available out there, how can we establish who's got what phenotype and uh, the people that we're most interested in. Um, and so, so for... Um, for just straight up disease phenotypes, you can use diagnosis coding. So, um, so within UPDB anyway, I've used ICD-6 through 10 and ICD oncology. Cancer has its own, uh, that's international classification of diseases. You can use procedure coding. So, you know, they had surgery to fix, uh, you know, a, a what, an anorectal malformation. Um, you can use radiological images or evaluation, <clears throat> labs, medications, pathology. Treatment response, obviously you wanna know what the treatment was, medications, and what the responses were, maybe lab results, survival. And then environmental factors, you might wanna know about their kind of the exposures they've had. So all of those could fit into phenotypes, and, and, and I'll give you some examples of those. So there's three different sources of phenotypes that my group uses, and, and I sort of have them ranked here by, uh, by my preference. So you can go into the SEER tumor registry that became a registry in 73, but actually, we have cancer data back to the 40s and 50s for some people in Utah. Then we have linked death certificates from 1904, as I said. So, I mean, how cool is that? 110 years worth. The bummer is, like, we had a breast cancer family, and we were trying to figure out what some people early, way up high in the pedigree died of, and it was like... Um, fell off a wagon or, you know, <laughs> oh, my favorite, the hand of God. <laughs> I mean, you know, well, I'm not sure what phenotype we're going to give that person. And then there's hospital data, which you would imagine should be absolutely the best, but um, no, it's frightening, frightening, and uh, it's proven extremely difficult, but we're going to go through these just by, so, so, um, so the cancer registry data, um, a, a National Cancer Institute Sur Surveillance Epidemiology and End Result um, Cancer Registry is just like top notch. Like, 
you're, you can't get in there without 18 different people confirming that you have cancer. So, um, so in Utah, every cancer, everybody who's treated, diagnosed or treated for cancer <clears throat> has to go in the registry and every hospital and facility has a registrar who checks it. So all the cases in there have histopathologic confirmation. They're the best. Um, th there's just nothing better than, than uh, and, and when I'm really spoiled because we started off with cancer phenotypes. So, um, so it's, it's, it does only have independent primary cancers. That's kind of a bummer. It doesn't have metastatic, um, but there's no ascertainment bias. Uh, or recall bias, like a lot of people who want to study prostate cancer pedigrees, they ask some doc and he starts asking his patients, hey, do you have any relatives? Oh, you're my first family. Hey, you got any relatives? Oh, you're my next family. We don't have that. Our families are absolutely positively uniformly collected from across the state. Um, and, and that helps a lot. And then also population based. Um, so cancer phenotypes, the kind of things you might use, like the primary site, like you just might want to think about uh, breast cancer as any cancer that occurred in the breast. You might want to think about histology, so a little more detailed. Was it lobular or ductal or uh, carcinoid or, um, oh, there's some kind of mucus. Anyway, there's a million different histologies. Um, behavior, was it benign or malignant? Mostly only malignant cancers get into the tumor registry um, unless like it's a brain cancer and it doesn't matter if it's benign. If it grows, it's going to kill you. So it gets a it gets in there because the behavior is significant. So, so stage, how far was it spread in your body and grade? What are the cells, how differentiated do the cells look? Or, so all of these things could become potential cancer phenotypes. You know, uh, was it a, a lethal cancer? Did it, did, did, did it kill you right away? Um, and so this is kind of just an example like I say, at the end of this, you're going to say how sad it is over there, how they have to do it. Cancer is our best, though. So here's some cancer coding examples. I probably have 100 different cancers that I study in my group. Um, but So we study lung and bronchus as one primary site. So I can study all the lung cancer cases. Um, and so that includes all the sites that are in the lung or bronchus and any histology that's not a leukemia or a lymphoma. But lung cancer comes in all shapes and sizes. So, so my collaborators want to study small cell lung cancer. And it's quite easy to, to select particular histology codes that represent small cell um, and then non-small cell is a little larger and then the less common carcinoid so we have a table like this that has I don't know a hundred or so entries for all kinds of different primary uh, primary site and, and histology combinations I can I could put in behavior. Sometimes for the skin cancers, they want to include behave, the, the lower behaviors, not uh, the benign behaviors. Um, gosh, I'm trying to remember. Oh, gee. It's, no, it's gender. But it makes me crazy. It's not gender. Gender is masculine and feminine. It's sex. But in Utah and the rest of the world, nobody wants to say sex anymore. That really means sex, zero and one. Um, and then these are just like inclusions and exclusions. So, so that's how we code cancer. And like I say, we're really lucky. Our cancer data in Utah is the best. And this has proven sufficient to date for most of the cancer stuff I do. Can you tell us how that data got entered? Um, like at the tumor registry, at the hospital, yeah, like at the... Not, like, tell us about registries and how did we get this data? Yeah, okay, so that, that's a really interesting question. And, and I probably should know more. So like I say, every, every uh, hospital and facility in Utah is required by law, by law, to report your cancer cases. Um, and so they have a reporting mechanism, um, and it, it gets to the 
tumor registry. Most of the big hospitals have at least one registrar who checks them out. So um, somebody can show up with a diagnosis code of lung cancer in their medical record, but it could be because a test was done to rule out lung cancer. And so later on, the, the tumor registrar checks it and decides, you know what, it wasn't a cancer case, so, so they make sure it doesn't go into the database. And, and that's one of the many problems with the medical record. Um, if the registrar likes it, then there's a, there's, I don't know, I think it's like a two or three page abstract that they have to fill out. So I was telling you, you know, you get stage and grade and behavior, but you also get all kinds of treatment, um, uh, uh, um, all kinds of more detailed staging and descript characterization of the cancer. Um, and it goes to the tumor registry, but this is another interesting problem. Uh, it goes to the tumor registry and the tumor registry um, has to validate everything before they send it back to NCI, obviously, because it's being used by more and more people. So typically uh, our tumor registry is about two years behind because they're so careful about validating every single case and getting the data right. So about two years after you're diagnosed with lung cancer, your data is gonna show up in UCR and potentially be linked to, to the genealogy. So that's, that's about all I know, but as I say, like that, it, it, it's checked inside out and upside down and it, it's the best quality data. So um, as I was saying, um, Usually I just use primary site and, uh, and histology to define cancers, but one of my newer projects is with lung cancer. And it turns out that lung cancer kind of um, smoking as a risk factor kind of goes along with certain histologies. So, um, and I, I think it matches. I think if you, non-smokers are more likely to be non-small cell and smokers are more likely to be, I got it right, okay. Um, so, um, so it would be really useful. Um, so, and smoking is what? It's familial, right? So if you have a family of lung cancer cases, maybe it's a family of smokers or maybe they have a gene. So it would be really, useful for me to know about their smoking history. So how can I get that and integrate it into my phenotype? Well, the best I could do, in like 1989, Utah was one of the first states to do this, which I think is cool. Utah has been a pioneer in so many things, but they actually started trying to keep track on death certificates, how much tobacco contributed. So if you look at the way it's stated on there, like, okay, we, they, they could have done a little better. Some of these are not particularly descriptive, like probably contributed to death, was underlying cause of death. Okay, so was underlying cause of death, I totally use that to call somebody a smoker. And did not contribute to cause of death, I totally use that to indicate somebody what, wasn't a smoker, but otherwise. Except it could have meant they died in a motorcycle accident, or they had gone. Exactly. Exactly. Or this is the best. My my lung doc said to me that family members say, "No, we don't want. He wasn't. No, he didn't smoke that much. We don't want you to put that on the death certificate." <laughs> Only in Utah, right? I don't know. <laughs> well, this is a very timely thing because we're working on smoking size extraction, including like her past, so very or heavier, light smoker, intermittent, or occasional, and also the metadata, like how many packs per day, what types of tobacco usage and stuff. So, this would be a great problem to apply. Right now. Oh my gosh, we we have to talk because you already are, you already made it to the bottom of my slide. So. I can only study the lung cancer cases who are dead. They're the only ones who have a death certificate. And so that's like, well, okay, that is actually quite a few of them. Um, that's a very deadly cancer. But only about half of them have tobacco coating, and only about half of the tobacco coating is informative for smoking. So somebody told me that every, at every appointment now at the University of Utah, the clinicians are required to collect smoking history and it's going into the EDW, so I... Meaningful use requirement for the last three to five years. So 
least. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's absolutely fantastic. So that, that would be hugely valuable to help us study lung cancer because so when I first came to Utah in 1978, the reason Mark Skolnick built that genealogy and linked it to cancer records was because he was convinced that cancer was genetic. Um, and at the time, nobody thought cancer, okay, lung cancer was caused by smoking and maybe cervical cancer by virus and everybody just thought it was all environmental. And still, I run across people, we, we just published a paper um, that looked at lung cancer heritability to, to show that you know, even when you take into account the smoking and separate it, there's very good evidence for a genetic predisposition to lung cancer. And I still have people contacting me saying, what? There's no way. Everyone knows lung cancer is caused by smoking and exposure. So it would be hugely valuable to us to be able to. So Danielle, you have to call me on that, that one. Um, okay, so death certificates. Death certificates are my second favorite. Um, phenotype source because sometimes they're really awesome. So I just picked two um, examples. So in the UPDB anyway, I have ICD-6 through 10. If you guys know about ICD coding, oh my gosh, it is the saddest thing you've ever seen. So it, every, it gets redone about every 10 years, and I mean redone, like they shake it and turn it upside down and pour it out. So, so you might find something in ICD-6, and it might not even show up in 7 and 8, or it's grouped with some other funky thing. That So, so international classification of disease coding, it, it's pretty sad. And death certificates, by reputation, okay, they're horrible. Whoever the physician was who was there when they died maybe doesn't even know them. Who knows what they put? So, so death certificates are rough and tough, but, um, but there's a few really good ones. Okay, so sudden infant death syndrome, it's only ever assigned based on autopsy. Um, intracranial aneurysm, you know, is like, I guess, one of the many forms of stroke, but it can only be assigned if there actually is evidence uh, uh, inside the brain of some kind of bubble. So, so there are some phenotypes that are really good. Um, I've had a clinician go through Parkinson's. Um, we used uh, death certificates and people who also had hospital data and um, and for we couldn't find hospital data for all the deaths, but we did find confirmatory hospital data for like 68% of the Parkinson's deaths. So there are some other causes of death where I really feel pretty good about using a death certificate. Um, but you know, I don't know, Alzheimer's, I, I don't think I would ever use a death certificate. Um, Cancer, I wouldn't use a death certificate because we have a tumor registry. So, so you have to be careful. Um, the nice thing about death certificates is, as I said before, if you're studying people who are already dead, you have a little bit more leeway in what you can do. So that makes it a good phenotype source. So my third favorite, sadly, is the linked um, EDW data, but, but you guys have all learned this in your studies, like EDWs are awesome, but they, they aren't collecting data so you can do good research. That is not their mission in life, and so it's not always good for us doing research. But, so I chose some examples. Um, so um, it's been ICD-9 coding in, in UUHSC and Intermountain for some time. Just recently, they had have ICD-10 too, and usually I just give them my ICD-9 codes and the IT people do a translation and add the ICD-10. Um, I, I'm not very familiar with the procedure coding, like I don't know how many versions of CPT they've ever been. I only have, in my 40 years, have only heard of CPT-4. Um, but but, um, but pr to me, the, the best thing in hospital data is the procedure coding. So uh, uh, again, a diagnosis might be in there because you were trying to rule something out. 
but a procedure, if it's, so Chiari malformations, it's some kind of a, some kind of a malformation back here in the, at, near the cerebellum. There's these two things that hang down. They call them tonsils, but I guess because it looks like, and they can get misshapen and get squoze and uh, cause headaches and other, it can be very serious to just, you know, mild headaches, but there's a diagnostic code that we use, but there's also a procedure to to repair it. So the combination of those two, and you wouldn't even really need the combination, the procedure code is, is pretty adequate. The problem is you probably don't catch everybody. Um, we could, in fact, use radiology images to get a finer phenotype because apparently there's all different sizes and shapes and distances that people use. To There's Chiari malformation type 1 and type 2. So if we had this sort of data, we could actually do a better job of phenotyping. But right now, this is what we use. Um, and so another similar example is, is rotator cuff. So, um, so we have this general phenotype of rotator cuff dysfunction. So that's where, you know, I don't know, it's the tendons up here and you can't do your arms and yeah. Um, <laughs> I study so many phenotypes, I don't really know them all very well. And it kind of doesn't matter to me. I try not to get personally involved in my phenotypes. <laughs> Because if you get too close to it, then you'll be diagnosed with it, and that's a real <laughs> bummer. It's happened to me a couple times now. Trigger finger? Who's ever even heard of trigger finger? These guys introduced me to trigger finger within a year. I was in there getting a trigger finger fix. Oh, medical student syndrome. <laughs> God, it's got to be. I probably... It's probably nice to right. Yeah, you're like, wait, oh, that's not supposed to do that. Okay, so, so rotator cuff dysfunction or tear, there's a lot of different ICD-9 codes, and there's a procedure for fixing um, for fixing the tear. Um, and oh, that's really weird. I think I must have made a typo. But if you just want to grab the people who have rotator cuff surgery, you can just stick with the diagnostic codes. And I'll tell you why I chose this example, because we study rotator cuff a lot. So if we ask for people who have the, one of these ICD-9 codes and and that, or that procedure code, we get 6,000 people. But if we try to fig figure out who's actually had surgery to repair a tear, which to me is sort of positive gold, like they really had a tear or they wouldn't have had surgery, there's only 600. And my doc, my surgeon said, yeah, there's a whole bunch of people in here who probably really didn't have a tear, um, but, uh, there's more than 600 here. We're not capturing it in the medical record. So we asked, um, gosh, what's Marta's last name? Heilbrunn. We asked Marta to help, and we're kind of in the middle of this, but um, um, we asked her if she could go look. Oh, I think, Brian, she said you were working on some of the stuff. Um, but she did kind of a crude search for full thickness or complete um, rotator cuff tear, <clears throat> and she only found 150, and some of them were preceded by no. Um, and so that didn't solve our problem. Well, okay, so the problem is we're writing a grant, and we need more than 600 people, and we know there's more than 600 people. So what's our solution? Again, this is how I how you see the sadness in my life. Our solution is we're going to identify those 6,000 people who look like they might have had one, and we're going to grab all the ones who have a shoulder MRI, and somebody, probably not the PI, <laughs> is going to review them by eye for a tear, and that's how we're going to capture them. And that's just, to me, that's really sad, and I think that probably someone in this room could solve this problem for us, um, right? I mean, somebody reads every one of those so sh shoulder MRIs and has to make a conclusion. So we know it's in the medical data somewhere, um, but we're, we're having to do it by hand. 
So um, are we doing, oh, I already went over. Okay, I'm gonna, so we're, we're wrapping up. So, um, so the University of Utah, you should totally recognize how lucky you are to be here. The University of Utah is pioneering in so many things. You know, especially biomedical informatics, but like the genealogical resources, et cetera. Um, and because we have all these unique resources, we have fantastic opportunities. And to do the kinds of genetic studies that we do, um, the phenotype is just a critical thing. We, we found the first, um, P16 is CDKN2A. It's the first um, melanoma predisposition gene. And we did not have the biggest set of pedigrees. We didn't have the most cases. Um, we didn't have a lot going for us. But what we had going for us was when we studied a high-risk melanoma pedigree, every one of those people had melanoma confirmed in a tumor registry. And every one of their relatives who we said was affected was affected. Most people in the world were just, you know, ascertaining through doctors and sometimes it was a family history diagnosis so we really still today believe we found that gene first because we had the phenotype right in our pedigrees so it is really the most critical part and and you have to remember every single data repository that you deal with it has its own history and it has its own mission and you have to think of that before you think of using the data. Just like we said about the EDW, it serves a particular purpose, not the purpose you have in mind. So you have to understand how that data got in there um, before you try to go in and use it. And you know, then like I said, I think there's still huge room for improvement. I would love to work with anybody who wants to try to use Utah electronic data to you know, maintain the lead that we have in Utah today. And I think that was my last slide because I started to do acknowledgements, but, um, but I didn't really ask anyone to do it. It's just what we do. <laughs> Thanks. Probably wore out the battery. <laughs> so Lisa, like I got this, you know, money to build these image phenotyping services. So if you're actively doing that, Chiara, <laughs> Chiari? Chiari. I, th I was thinking chorizo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would love to pull the images out of the packs and, and get an image processing pipeline set up with that something. Well, it's actually the reports that are pretty good at finding those. That's a nice example of a clean one. Yeah. But if you want like the shape, you know, the, like the fine tune. You know, yeah, you know. that sounds great. So, so right now the. Um, this is funny, I sort of convinced my colleagues that before we tried to go in and sort into Chiari type 1 and Chiari type 2, we needed to go and see whether they cluster in pedigrees, because if they do, then that subtlety doesn't matter. It's, there's a predisposition for overall, and that's just the spectrum of what, you know, the, all the things that can happen when you have that gene. But, but the rotator one, like we're writing a grant for that right now, and, and the grant says that we're going to read 6,000 yeah, images. Text, I think the text we could, we could tackle pretty easily. The other, so kind of, I asked Will Dare this, and he didn't really give a good answer, I thought. So, so you've got this, you got this genealogy, so you go back, you know, 100 years. So what's the most valuable resource to be collecting right now? So how valuable would it be to be collecting blood samples from all these 80-year-olds that are in the system and they're going to die in a, you know, die in a few years, versus just, do you just... Yeah. So no. So okay. So you're talking to the totally most biased person on the planet Earth. But I've been trying to convince people at the University of Utah, number one, to collect every single person who walks through the door because it's not that expensive to just collect the sample and store it somewhere. And and number two, I've written this grant several times. There have been these go grants and. To, to say, look, we need to sample the eldest people in Utah right now because there's still people alive who survived polio, who survived the influenza, who, you know, who survived 
measles, you know, and, and every generation is less and less. So I totally have tried this. And, and luckily, this is the most fantastic thing about my resource. So we started sampling people back in 1970. I have people that were born in the late 1800s. I, in the genealogy, I probably have one in a sample for one in 10 of those people. So luckily, because we've been doing this for 40 years, we actually have samples. So um, but I have this disagreement all the time. I have a grant I'm helping Huntsman write right now. And they want to start down here with the newly diagnosed cancer cases and screen every single one of them with a panel, a colon cancer panel, right? And I'm like, why don't you go back a couple generations and sequence all these people with your panel? And then you know whose descendants, you just, you'll cut, at every generation, you'll cut who you have to sample in half. So everyone has different opinions. Some people don't think DNA is, is even useful to store. Um, Steve Hunt studied pedigrees for many years and he's kind of sort of retiring. And, uh, and I was with a group that was asked to consider his resource and they called in a, uh, some kind of expert whose advice was, it's useless, destroy it. Are you kidding me? So there are some people who think tissues aren't useful at all. And there's some people who think you should be sampling here. And then there's some people, yeah, like me. Yeah, oh, I, t I had, my grant was awesome. I had a guy in the history department who was gonna do oral histories. Be just, uh, you know, what, what were these people's experience with these different diseases? And that was going to be stored in the library. And then I was, gonna, it was like my retirement plan. We were going to have these clinics down at St. George. There used to be this restaurant, Kenny, some, Kenny Rogers. Did he have, does he have restaurants? So there was some chicken rotisserie restaurant in St. George. And I was like, my clinic coordinators are just going to come here every day and just, and everyone who walks in, they're going to recruit. Cause it was all these old people eating potato salad. So I had it all figured out. I totally think that's uh, I think that's the right thing to do, but nobody really agrees with me except you. <laughs> <laughs> that makes two of us. <laughs> All right, a couple of questions. Uh, do you have any access to the missionary database at all from the LDS Church for Ocket studies? No, that's a really interesting idea. Gosh, you know who we should talk to about that is is the UPDB people, because the Utah population. So, so Mark's group created it, but it got donated to the university, to the state, who gave it to the university, who gave it to the cancer center. So it's very protected now. Like we we don't get to keep a copy, or we don't have any identify and nothing like that. But. Uh, but they actually work with the church quite regularly. So they've used membership, active membership to decide for things like when they were trying to do environmental exposures. So I bet they could get access to the, Potentially. yeah, that's a really good idea. The other question was, JAMA I've published something recently that said that the outcome of the Gen Epi studies are finding mostly spurious associations. Oh, I government, are you guys in T totally agree with you. So, so I, I, the only reason I mentioned that as my second type of genetic study was because it had sort of a different outcome in terms of like, do you care if someone's phenotype is correct or not because of the controls? We, we don't do GWAS for gene discovery. We do it for validation. I think that has been the biggest boondoggle of science in, in my lengthy career. The millions, maybe more than millions, maybe billions of dollars that have been spent on these huge populations to find a risk factor, a relative risk of 1.2. It's a, you wouldn't even bother counseling somebody on the, you know, that's so close to population rate, it doesn't even, yeah, I, I, I totally agree those with. Those aren't your studies, then. No. They're different than those ones. Yeah, no, no. We, so, the G, G was, yeah. But what about FIWAS? Well, I mean, so, so it's, it's, 
<laughs> I love that name. That was a very clever thing to do. So, so FIWAS is just like GWAS on steroids, because you got one GWAS studies one phenotype, and a FIWAS studies every phenotype you can possibly get. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, that's the, uh, that's the sad thing about this is, okay, so we used to study pedigrees, but pedigrees are pretty hard to find. We have good resources in Utah. We can find them. If other people worked kind of a little bit hard, they could do pedigrees too. But way early decades ago, people go, you know what? Like, it's so hard to get pedigrees. Like, we should just do case control. It would just be like way cheaper. Everyone can find cases and controls. So I really think it was this concept of, well, I can't get pedigrees, so I'm just going to gather more and more. So these case control studies are, you know, 50. So there have been studies of prostate cancer, 50,000 cases. And, and now they're saying, OK, well, gosh, we're just not going to be able to go to the next level unless we crank it up and get twice as many cases. What if, 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 to find some more 1.15 relative risk. So what if your third favorite of, of phenotyping source, the, the EHR, the warehouse, did a, the proper job of phenotyping people in a standardized way, uh, assisted with some NLP to extract critical features that aren't coded, uh, and, and so you do have a proper EHR quote phenotype on millions of people, all the vets and whatever. That's kind of the same thing. And then you can start asking the same question. You, so you're already phenotyped in a more standardized way, which doesn't exist, right. of course. Right, and that, that is the most critical thing. And in, in fact, I wrote, um, I think I'm just ahead of my time. I wrote this NLP grant. Um, I mean, not NLP, NLM. Um, and NLM doesn't have that much money. They don't fund that many grants, but they funded this grant. I mean, it has to be 15 years ago. And I was so naive. Stan Huff was my uh, investigator. We said, we're going to go into the EDW, because we'd been doing cancer studies forever, and now we wanted to move into hospital data. So I said, we're going to define 2,000 phenotypes using you know, coding and NLP methods, and then we're going to analyze the evidence for a genetic contribution, and then we'll find the pedigrees. So every one of those phenotypes we study, we'll hand that off to some guy in cardiology or you know, hematology, and they can go study that disease. Um, and uh, yeah, for various political reasons. The, the worst problem was um, was the UPDB said, that sounds like data mining, so uh, we're just not going to approve it. And then I said, but I already have a grant, so you kind of have to. So they said, OK, so then each one of your 2,000 phenotypes has to be a separate proposal. So I probably got through like 10 or 15 a year instead of. Uh, but but it was also difficult to get Stan like motivated to do like so we were just getting physicians and working our way through the phenotypes and and I'm as I'm as enthusiastic to do that today as I was then any phenotype anybody wants to study I I totally am with you now if I had those phenotypes because I think we will one of these days would I do a GWAS? I would find the high-risk pedigrees and study the high-risk pedigrees still. Uh, and, and, you know, y you can go round and round, but, but in, until a GWAS finds a, a relative risk that actually is going to make you change your behavior, like if, you, if, if, I, if anybody in the room, if you have a first-degree relative with cancer, you're at twice the population rate. Okay, so, and, and does that make anybody even stop and think? No, not really. People are not going into their doctor because of, and so a relative risk of 1.15 is, is so much more, so much more less meaningful, so much less. I started that off wrong. Um, so, so yeah, I still wouldn't do, I think if you find, if you find one gene that explains even only one pedigree of 
Chiari malformations, that gene's function is going to tell you, is going to teach you so much. So you might only be able to counsel that one family, but you'll learn about the genetics of that disorder. So I'm, I'm still, I'm totally biased. I probably could just never be changed. I, I'm just never going to be a GWAS person <laughs> or a FIWAS person. Uh, this may sound like a completely naive and dumb question, but. Who doesn't have a relative with cancer? I mean, it's such a common cause of death. Like, have you found pedigrees where no one has cancer? So, yeah, so we've written a couple of, um, this is, no, that's not a dumb question at all, because you're right, like, you know, one in three, is it is it one in three people now, or one in four anyway will have cancer. So we've gone in and used the UPDB to do something I think is really cool, which is, is um, estimate risk for disease based on uh, your whole constellation of family history, so your first degree relatives and your second and your third, how many of them were affected, you know, at what age and what's your relative risk. And so for, um, for prostate cancer, 40, only 40% 40 of men, I'll say it the other way around, 60% of men have at least one first, one second, or one third degree relative with prostate cancer. And, and all of those relatives, even out to third degree, affect your risk. So, um, so yeah, there are, there are still people who have no family history of disease. It's, um, and, and I don't know if that's because disease, because cancers are clustered within these high risk pedigrees is the most likely explanation. But there, there really are, you know, probably for most cancers, I'd say uh, only about only about 60, 65 percent of people have a family history of a, any particular cancer. If you just went, if you said any cancer, any then cancer. then you'd be the one in three and yeah. it wouldn't be worth doing. And and the interesting thing is cancer is thought to be very cancer predisposition is thought to be very site specific, like. If you have breast cancer, then you're usually counseled to get screened for breast cancer. Um, not the, people don't think that increases your risk of any other cancer. We're starting to find that probably like 10 to 15 percent of people um, who have one of these common cancers actually carry a predisposition that's responsible for other types of cancers. So for instance, if, if there, I think 12% uh, of metastatic prostate cancer cases have a variant in a known cancer gene that's thought to be a breast or colon cancer or pancreas cancer gene. So if, you're, if your dad dies of prostate cancer, that suggests 12, one, one in eight such men should be screened for these other cancers, but, but nobody knows that, so. Lisa, since we're just kind of wrapping up this data science course, can you comment on the, the UPDB's philosophical opposition to data, data mining, since they said you can't do this data mining? <laughs> uh, that's really interesting, too, because because I'm not, I, I don't think I'm always on top of, uh, of the, yeah, um, yeah, I have to say I don't really understand it. Um, I do know, so Will Deere has arrived in town recently. He worked, he used to work for Amgen, and um, he's an awesome guy because his mind is like wide open. Don't tell me what you never did because you thought you couldn't. Let's just figure out what we can do. And he's like, wait, what? Wait a minute, you're not gonna data mine? Like, isn't that the whole point of the creating these giant resources so you can like generate hypotheses, test hypotheses? So I'm hoping he's gonna change the view. Um, I can tell you one experience I had with RGE. We wrote a proposal to study rotator cuff disease. This has been many, many years. And so you submit your proposal and then you get your review back and you got to deal with all. And, and the review said, um, no, this study shouldn't be approved because rotator cuff disease isn't genetic. Everybody knows that. 
go, oh my gosh, they have God on their review panel. <laughs> and that is one disease he forgot to make genetic. No, it just it made, me so, made me so mad. But yeah, I, I totally agree. Like the whole point is let's think of new hypotheses and test them. And that might open us up to, I mean, how many people in here who, who, who've done some science have figured out something pretty important from the stupidest either idea or mistake? It happens all the time. That's one of the ways science moves forward. So you have to be able, what's that? That's the major way science moves forward. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I, I think so, yeah. So, so I, I think it's changing because Will Deer showed up in town. Because I really don't understand, uh, I don't understand why there would be any aversion to that at all. Oh, and the other person is Mark Yandel. He's in human genetics. And he's a big proponent of big data. And so Will Deer's kind of pulled him in. So I think with the team that's here today, I think this will probably change. But I couldn't, in a million years, I couldn't explain to you the logic behind and we've had both of them as speakers. In this oh, really? Oh, awesome. Yeah. Oh, so did you ask? Wait, you've had. Mark. Oh, Mark oh, but. And Will. and Will. Did you have uh, the UPDB? No, we should have. Yeah, because you could ask him your. Yeah. Anyway, you should email him because Ken is totally. He, he, he thinks he's a sociologist demographer. He thinks very differently. It, it was, you know, I would do it a certain way. He's been adding all kinds of data that I, I think expanded in other ways. And I think this missionary thing that you're talking about totally fits That's with. That's the form of a longevity question. And then be okay. Yeah, yeah, and then you'll be okay, right? Does that have to do with aging? And yeah, I think he would be very interested in that. And he is actually, I just heard, he is trying to go and get a lot of extra genealogy data um, from the church. He's going to try to add like 200 million people, individuals from the uh, church's genealogy data. But I've been here long enough to remember we tried this once before. <laughs> and it was a disaster because... You really have to have the most excellent computer scientists when you try to build and link genealogies because um, because all that data has come from people who put it together. And you would not believe the complex knots that you can tie when you're trying to do genealogy. So once before, we got all this data from the church and tried to load it, and it just turned the UPDB into a big people's... Uh, you know, their own grandfather was also their kid and all married to their, it was just a disaster. It's really hard to do. I mean, the, the funniest example is, is like twins, okay? Like twins are awesome. You want to find them in your genealogy. But, but what, do, what do twins look like? They look like data errors. Like one little typo, Homer and Omer. <laughs> that really was a family we studied. You know, it's like, oh, that's a mistake. Take one of those guys out. I wonder which one it is. No, they're twins. So, um, so genealogy data, you just have to know a lot of tricks to do genealogy data well. And your idea for the Intermountain family health history, you know, there, does, does Microsoft Health, health Vault still exist? It doesn't seem like there's really a great consumer resource for your own records. So no, I think you're right. My chart, which is all for looking at uh, with Epic. And I'm sure so Health Vault's the only one that's still kind of out there is Google got out of it, but that's still, it's still being used by lots of companies and vendors so to throw your blood pressure data and you know, my automatic blood pressure and scale things will go in there. Yeah, and, and Intermountain did try to build their own family history collection tool, but I, I, that's um, Grant anywhere. Wood. Yeah, it doesn't seem to it be. It hasn't really gone anywhere. Yeah. It really gained traction, and then um, there were all these issues over, you know, 
who has the right to include what relatives and which great offer right I mean there are there are tricks yeah like you got to say when you go into I mean we, we thought through some of these things when you put your data in there you got to say whether you want to share it or not and when you want to get your data out, you have to say whether you're interested in using your relatives' shared data or not. So that, yeah, there, there, it is, it is pretty tricky. But, but Intermountain is talking again. I, my, my one idea for a company, except I just can't go that route. Like I, I just could never do the company thing. But if I did, I, I, and I, I've talked to scientists. I'm trying to do it with scientists. It would be this concept of building the genealogy of the United States and providing that to healthcare providers. So, like the VA, um, because uh, you know the the concept is you can use people's family history. You can you do so much with predicting who should get what. If you're a first-degree relative of someone with an intracranial aneurysm, which will kill you a lot of the time and disable you the rest of the time, um, you, we, we, we screened 400 people who were first-degree relatives of an intracranial aneurysm, and 40 out of 400 had an undiagnosed aneurysm. Every hospital... Every hospital should be totally screening those. So I think they they could use for they could use family history to decide who to be screened for what. Who are the high risk people to be screened for what? And also clinical trials. Like, wouldn't you rather put the highest risk people in a clinical trial than any old everybody randomly selected? And then at some point when genetic testing is done, I saw this cool PLOS One paper. These guys took these mesotheliomas, which is like, I guess, a kind of a lung cancer, but expo definitely exposure related. Um, and they sequenced them. Maybe they even only genotyped them. But they found a bunch of these people ha had exactly the same on their chromosome. Not only did they have this one particular variant, but it was sitting in a, a ch you call it a haplotype. All all the markers along there were exactly the same in these people who they didn't think were related. That doesn't happen unless you have a common ancestor. So they went and found the common ancestor of these two guys. And it was somebody back in Germany in the 1700s. I almost cried when I read that paper. I was like, this is like what it's all about. They found this common ancestor. And then now they're studying the whole family. And there's all these people with all kinds of different cancers. And you know, down at the bottom, how it started was people with mesothelioma who mostly come in because they like got exposed to Asbestos. Asbestos. So not even thinking that there was anything genetic going on, and now they've found this giant pedigree. And they so so I I think it. So I have a guy back at Innova Health Systems, and we're talking about doing this for him, building a genealogy and linking it to his patients, so we can give him some of that kind of advice. I think it would be really cool. Well, it would be better if there was only one database where all the data was kept, but that's not going to happen. And, but my solution to that is everybody has their own medical and family history data, and it's like in a tooth or in your wrist bone or something, and like you, you, you take it with you, and maybe it even has the... Um, the processor that updates the, your data and your risk as time goes on. I don't know. Anyway, the world will be way more interesting for you guys. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was a lot of fun. I, I won't ever stop if, if you don't stop me.